upper GI bowel obstruction. Like if it's a baby who's let's say three days of old and is three days old has never stooled and has an imperfect anus, we're not going to look for 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 that. But if it's a baby with bilious vomiting, any baby with bilious vomiting needs an upper GI series immediately. Okay, and that so that would be a situation to think about in practical terms. Let's say you had the option with with distance, you had the option of going ground, okay, or you could do air. Um, I would do air, okay, in a situation like this, because you want to get there as fast as possible and get this baby back, because taking them to the OR could mean the difference between saving all their bowel or having them lose all their bowel. And they wouldn't have any air in the bowel, so we wouldn't pressurize to a special pressure. Um, well, no, they, well, no, they wouldn't. They'd have no air in the bowel because it's yeah, obstructed. Yeah. So yeah. just take it out Shouldn't be any issues. There. I don't think there should be, be okay. issues there. No. This is just showing you the, the malrotation. Um, this would be an example. Um, this is a small descending hemicolon. Um, you can see this in diabetes. So um, if you get a baby that's, um, again, they'd be older. Because it's, you know, the lower the obstruction, the later the presentation. Makes sense when you think about it. If you've got an esophageal obstruction with the very first feed, the food just comes right back up, right? And the food's always going to be the same. It's just undigested milk. Okay? If it's a proximal obstruction, let's say at the stomach or in the proximal duodenum before the ampulla of vater, which is where your bile comes out of, okay? If it's proximal to the ampulla or the bile duct, what happens is you get, again, sort of curdled, di partially digested milk coming back. The moment you're past that, you're into, let's say, a, a, a distal duodenal atresia or a jejunal or ileal atresia, that's when you start seeing all the bile coming back. Okay, because the bile has nowhere to go. Because the bile, remember, and maybe you haven't been taught this, I don't know, is bile is absorbed in your terminal ileum. Okay, so basically, any obstruction after where the bile comes out and before where it's absorbed will lead to bile coming back. Okay. Whereas your colonic obstruction, Hirschsprung's and perforated anus, uh, those are the ones where um, they vomit, but it's usually like day two, day three, and then you go back and you say, oh, they never stooled. Okay. So the history is important. Now the history here would be, and you wouldn't know whether it's Hirschsprung's or not, you'd need a contrast. The history here would be that um, in a case like this, mom had type 2 diabetes, poorly controlled, and for reasons that I have no idea about, they, these kids tend to get a small left hemicolon. Okay. And that's what you would see. Now, how does this differ from Hirschsprung's? Well, it differs from Hirschsprung's in this. So you see this segment here, the sigmoid, so here's the rectum down here, comes up through the sigmoid. It's actually good caliber. But the thing about Hirschsprung's is, Hirschsprung's always starts low. It starts low and it goes up. So Hirschsprung's, if this was, let's say, very pencil thin all the way to the rectum, this could be Hirschsprung's. And this would be called the transition zone. If you've ever heard of the transition zone um, with Hirschsprung's, this is what they're looking for. They're looking to see where does it suddenly pop open. Okay. Um, this is a good example of Hirschsprung's. So you've got, because the bowel is all dilated, this is all large bowel around the outside. Because the bowel is all dilated, what it tells you is um, this is a very distal, rectal, Hirschsprung's. Okay. Because if it was, let's say it was up to here, you would see basically this dense tissue through here, which would be your undistended colon, and then you'd see the rest of it. But this would be a typical pattern of Hirschsprung's, just grossly dilated, full of gas. And no, uh, now let's say, I don't think I've, sh have I shown you perforation? No. Let's say you looked at this and you thought, holy smokes, that's a lot of gas. How do I know that's all in the bowel? How would you in the field make that diagnosis? Because you'd have to, you'd be telling me, Michael, I'm concerned. Is this baby's belly is huge. Baby? Position, how would you position? Uh, then we would do a viral x-ray to see if the air Yeah. So, what I want you to remember from this session is the liver is your friend. Yeah. Okay. What I mean by that is, 
The liver is a big, solid organ. So if you put somebody left side down, if there's free air in the belly, it pops up over the liver. And it goes in between the liver, cleaves away the liver from the peritoneal wall. Okay? So I'm sure you've seen this, where you see this big, thick rim of air. Okay? If you haven't, baby Henry. Again, <laughs> good example to look at that. You'll see the liver pushed away from the side of the, of the wall. Okay? Because of how solid that organ is. The other place that you may see, even on a flat plate, look under the diaphragm. If you see the diaphragm line, and then you see under the diaphragm, you see dark, black air. That's, well, black is air. So you might see air under the diaphragm, but otherwise just pop them on their side. The other thing that some people do is um, they'll just do what's called a shoot through. So you can do a, a, just a, a, a shoot through, meaning the baby's laying on their, their back and they just take the x-ray from the side and through. And what you'll see is this sort of crescent shaped um, top of air because the air rises. Okay? The other thing that you look for is something called the football sign. You can't see it here. This baby doesn't have a perforation, but if they did, what you'd see is a very dark football-like circle over here, or oval. And that would be, again, the air. If you ever saw that, if you ever saw something that you suspected might be air, just do the shoot-through. Just ask for a shoot-through, and then uh, do it that way. So meconium ileus, um, so we talked a little bit about meconium ileus. 90 to 90 for Percent, percent will be diagnosed as having CF, which is why we're so concerned about baby Henry. Uh, although, interestingly, he's an identical twin, and this twin didn't have the positive test for uh, screening for CF. Um, so, meconium ileus is usually in the small bowel. Uh, meconium plug has to do with um, this. Yeah, I'm just reading through here. I just want to make sure it's accurate. Meconium plug is usually more colonic, and it's usually more that small hemicolon, okay, so, and what happens is you get, to get as, the, as the colon reduces in caliber, it just gets blocked. Oh, here's a good example, forgot I had this. So, you don't have to look at baby Henry now if you don't want to, but this, this would be a good example of what it looks like. So, if you do an x-ray and you see all this white stuff, okay, this would be an example of meconium ileus. So, what happens is, meconium is so thick that the bowel is it's trying to propagate in utero and just ha have some degree of peristalsis. I mean, we don't, you don't see, um, you don't see stooling typically in utero, right? But the bowel is still increasing in caliber. It has some movement, and what happens is you can get a perforation in utero, and then you get all this meconium spilling into the peritoneal cavity, and it calcifies. This is the duodenal atresia. This is the so-called double bubble sign. If you didn't know what the double bubble sign is, now you do. Big bubble, little bubble. Um, neck. So with respect to neck, uh, neck is common. Uh, not as common as it used to be. Um, since we started using donor breast milk, we've seen a dramatic reduction in uh, rates of neck. We've also slowed down our feeds, but it still, it still certainly occurs. Clinical findings. Um, Neck, you know, I think I said last time, was it syphilis can be the great imitator or hypoglycemia can be the great imitator. Um, the other thing, and, and neonatal abstinence can be the great imitator. Unfortunately, neck cancer <coughs> too. Uh, for those of you who have cared for babies with neck, um, excuse me, when neck starts off, it's usually very tough to diagnose because the baby might be a little more lethargic, they could be a little more irritable, their belly might be a little extended, They're, they might have a slightly increase in their aspirates. Um, but nothing that you can really put your finger on. When they get the bloody stool, usually that's the point at which you know they've already developed some advanced neck. Um, that, of course, can lead to shock and acidosis. Um, and make no mistake about it, neck can be lethal, and it can go fast. Um, so from the time of presentation till the time that the child dies can be a matter of hours. And we saw that um, with one of our twins who's now uh, the baby U. I don't know if people know who that is, but uh, there was a baby in bed four, had a twin in bed one, and that baby on my week of service had just a streak, just a streak of blood in the stool. That was the first presentation, just a streak of blood, and within 24 hours was dead. You know, it was just dramatic and, uh, you know, went from a little bit of, of pneumatosis to full-blown 
neck very quickly. And then we had a second one actually over at St. Boniface about two weeks later that did the same thing. So um, I op what I tell parents and what you can tell parents is if you go to pick up a baby with neck, I always say to them, the next 24 hours is critical. We tend to do x-rays every eight hours for the first 24 hours because if they're going to declare themselves as, as being really sick and going down that spectrum of being, you know, basically incompatible with life, if they make it past the first 24 hours, usually things are, are, are going to be better. Michael, on your previous slide, it said uh, abdominal distension and uh, color change. Can you speak to that? Can you back? Well, just be, with the abdominal distension, they can get, because the bowel is inflamed, they can get redness of the belly. Certainly, if it perforates, you can get a bluish hue. Uh, if the bowel is ischemic, you can get a blue issue. So that's that's what I'm referring to. Thanks, Todd. Um, interestingly, because we do such an amazing job, and I'm not saying this facetiously, I mean we are doing an amazing job with our 23, 24, and 25 weekers these days. Um, because we're so meticulous, we're actually starting to see very little neck in this group. Um, in 2012, we had no cases under 29 weeks of neck at HSC. All of our cases were in 33, 35, and 36 weekers. Okay, so um, you're actually more likely these days to see neck in older kids. Um, is it less lethal in the older kids? No, no, just as. Yeah. Same. Uh, were you at CB recently? Like I went to CB or uh, to Brandon a few weeks ago to pick up a non-perforated neck, and he was very shocked when we got there. Like, yeah. quite ill. We had, well, have you been there? Yeah, recently? yeah, I was there. How did he make out? Like, he had, we had to give him um, FFP, and like, he was in bad shape. Remember the name? No, he's like, they, they thought he was a 32 weaker, although he looked more IUGR than. I can't that. remember. And I can't. he was at full feeds by. Yeah, three I can't days remember if he's the one. That one of them passed away. I can't remember if it was him or not, though. Yeah, uh, he was Norm, bad. Norm Silver sent that one. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he called me about it. I, I can't yeah. remember what happened. Okay. Um, so what do they have in common? They almost all have been fed. And what's almost, in all cases, they've all been fed cow's milk. Okay? So if they're fed human milk, it's almost non-existent. In fact, there was, um, just in case you're, if you don't believe that stat, um, there was a proof of concept study in Vancouver and Toronto where two hospitals went uh, and banned all formula. So that for a period of a year they banned formula, and so every baby had to receive human milk, whether it was mother's own or donor. And their rate of neck in Vancouver went from 10% of their under uh, 1,500 gram infants, 10% down to two, and in Toronto it went from nine to one. Oh. Yeah. So. So um, what about like the human milk fortifier and stuff that gets added to the breast milk? That is a hot topic, <laughs> <laughs> and one that I, I'll say I, um, I do have a conflict of interest in what I'm about to tell you, so I'll disclose that. Uh, the company that makes um, human-based human milk fortifier is Prolacta. Mm -hmm. um, Prolacta, they claim, reduces the risk of neck. Um, having said that, there's been no study that has looked exclusively at comparing an arm with human milk and prolacta versus human milk and cow's milk fortifier. They've compared the use of prolacta to mixed, where you had some formula, some cow's based fortifier, and they find a difference. Um, the studies are going to come uh, lo looking at that. Um, I, the conflict of interest I have is I'm engaged in a study where they're funding it. Um, so I actually, I used to be the one who approved it for use here, but I now John Byer does because uh, I didn't want to have um, that conflict of interest. Um, the stuff's incredibly expensive. Yeah. It's, yeah, it winds up being about $8.35 per mil. Um, and so if, if it comes as a 20 mil bottle, it's about 160 bucks a bottle. Um, the typical, if you're a 26 weeker uh, and you were to receive it till 33 weeks, your bill would be about $13,000. Yeah. Yeah. So the budget to do all of our babies under 1250 grams would be about $1.4 million a year here. That's a whole other talk. <laughs> but uh, but um, anyway, so pathogenesis, you know, ischemia, certainly, you know, things can lead to it. Um, you know, we question about PDAs. Certainly if you have in a term infant with cardiac disease, if they've got a coarct and you have intestinal ischemia, that could lead to uh, anything that leads to ischemia of the gut is essentially a risk factor for neck. 
uh, UACs used to be thought to be, but I think the conclusion now is really not. ECMO, definitely. Uh, we don't do that. Well, I guess we are going to be doing that here. Um, bacterial colonization. Um, I feel badly for the medical student that did this study. I can't remember who it was, but when I was a resident, somebody actually did this study, and what they did was they collected stools from babies that were human milk fed and stools that were formula fed, and it was medical students somewhere. And so that was a summer project, and what he did was he measured the different bacterial species fed human milk versus formula, and he found that um, the, there was a preponderance of gram-negative anaerobes in the uh, formula fed uh, uh, babies, and there was a preponderance of gram-positive anaerobes in the human milk fed babies. And the human anaerobes have now, there's been much, much more research done on this now, and that's, it's all the lactobacillus, the bifidobacterium, all the stuff that's in probiotics is what you tend to select out for when you feed human milk, so that's probably the reason. Now, getting to management. What is management? Well, all the stuff that you already know how to do. So, the ABCs, so attention to airway. These kids can get apneic very quickly. Um, certainly preterm infants, when they get neck, uh, apnea is usually one of the first things. And if you've worked in the unit, I mean, this is the classic, is a baby who is perfectly fine who just starts having lots of apnea. That may be the first sign. Um, NPO anywhere, I have 10 to 14 days, sometimes 7 days, uh, depends on how severe it is. AMP, gent, and flagell. I have Vanco in brackets here. Some people use Vanco. I know John Beyer had a fit the last time he saw Vanco being used for this. Um, he didn't feel that's appropriate, and that's fine. It's usually not staph epi or coagulized negative staph, you see. Um, and in fact, rarely, I, don't, I can't remember the last blood culture positive uh, patient I had with neck. NG should be deception, and I mentioned the serial x rays. Good idea to check a CBC, they can get thrombocytopenia. We don't check it enough, but I think coagulation is something very important to check. These kids can go into DIC very quickly. I would bet, or I'm looking at you, Kathy, I, but I, I would bet how often do this, the neonatologists say to you on transport, check an INR? Oh, never. Yeah. 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 So I think that's, but it is something we know these kids can become coagulopathic and ooze out of their sites. And then consult Pete's surgery for laparotomy or Penrose. The pendulum is really swinging. You guys are in a very interesting time. Um, I think people are. I think the surgeons are beginning to move away from Penroses. Uh, for a long time, they were just putting the Penrose in and saying, "Let's just let, let it sit." I think they're now putting the Penrose in in kids that are too critically ill to operate on. But um, if they are stable enough, I think they're more and more now they're going to start taking them for surgery because I think that strategy may not be as good as it was. So. Here's a good example of free air. So this would be perforated neck and you can see the air under the diaphragm. You can also see the air in this case because there's so much of it. This cleaves the liver away. This isn't the left lateral. This is just the air is, there's so much in the belly. It's actually moved the liver away. And that's why I said the liver's your friend because, because this is a nice solid organ as opposed to the bowel, it helps you to see where um, air is. Okay, so that's it. But so respiratory distress syndrome, if you didn't know what this is, this is the so-called whiteout chest. Okay? We call it the whiteout because it's white. Um, and moreover, when you can no longer see where the heart begins and ends, that's a whiteout. Okay, so one thing that um, will be true of the whiteout is the airways look beautiful. They're very easy to see. So you'll have nice dark trachea. Um, I can see a bronchus coming out here. And it's because you've got air surrounded by collapsed alveoli. Okay. Now, microscopically, normally you don't have this thick, pink, stained material sitting in your alveolus. But these are membranes, the so-called highline membrane disease. Okay. And in case, in case you're wondering, um, Winnipeg had uh, you weren't wondering maybe. Um, so some, uh, some of you would be old enough, some of you not old enough, or many enough years to remember Victor Chernick. Um, so Victor Chernick was past department head in, I think, 19, sometime in the 70s. Um, but Victor retired, I would say, early 2000s, probably. Um, and Victor, in 1963, um, published a paper with Mary Ellen Avery on the um, cause of highline membrane disease being lack of surfactant. So Winnipeg had a foot 
in the uh, initial description of, uh, of highland membrane disease. So it's been a long time. Um, to put it also in perspective, I like to give this perspective because this is a personal experience. So my brother and sister were born in 1974 here in, in this hospital. And my brother had highland membrane disease. So this is 1974, that's not that long ago. Um, and he was born at 34 weeks. And my father went into the unit and said, uh, spoke to the neonatologist, whose name you can't remember, I've always asked him which one it was, but I can't remember who it was, but the neonatologist called him in a room and he said, because uh, uh, he was on some, some degree of respiratory support, and he said to my father, um, I'm giving your son a 50-50 chance by being alive by morning. Because there was no antenatal steroids, there was no surfactant. Basically, kids would blow pneumos and they would either survive or not survive. And so, yeah, that was 74. You know, can you imagine 50-50 chance at 34 weeks? <coughs> then my brother survived. Um, but now, if I told you there was a 34-weeker coming, you know, it would be nothing. What's that? When do you start feeding the baby? <coughs> yeah. That's what he said. Right, can you get me some water? Sure. <coughs> Excuse me. Actually, I'll just step outside and grab some because I feel a coughing fit coming on. Your type 2 pneumocytes are the one, pneumatocytes are the ones in your lung that actually make surfactant. So until you have a preponderance of these cells, you don't really make a lot of surfactant. What antenatal steroids do is antenatal steroids actually increase the production of surfactant by increasing the population of these cells. And the best description that I, you know, if you're ever trying to, well, my description is not the best one, but the way I explain to families who, you know, in lay terms to explain why their baby is having so much distress, is I talk about engine oil for a car. And I say that, you know, if you try to run your car without oil, you know, the cylinders just, you know, gum up from the heat. You need to have that lubrication. Same idea with the lung. The surfactant, what it does is it releases surface tension. So the surface tension causes your alveolar to collapse also makes it very difficult when there's a lot of surface tension, very difficult to open it up. Um, so the surfactant makes it easier. Another way to describe it to families is I ask them if they, you know, if they tried to blow up those tiny little balloons, the little latex balloons, you know, your eyes are going to pop out until you actually get it open a little. And once it gets open, then it goes, gets up. Same idea. It's that initial surface tension you need to break. Um, excuse me, why do the kids in draw? Well, they in draw because their chest walls, typically the kids that have common membrane disease are preterm. And so the chest wall is quite thin. And when they're drawing such a negative pressure, what happens is the chest starts to suck in. Okay, and that's why you get that. Um, so what can, uh, what can you do about it? So this is looking at um, CPAP versus intubation. This is actually a very recent study. This is from a colleague of ours that we've done some research with, uh, Mark Smolter, uh, who's a neonatologist in Edmonton. He published this recent um, study which really looked at all these studies, a ton of studies looking at um, the use of CPAP versus intubation because I would say probably from 2008 to 2015 this was the hottest topic out there. You know, should you be intubating in case room or should you be using CPAP? And when you look at death or BPD, um, it's slightly, you know, it's slightly just almost on the side of favoring CPAP, although the tail of this just touches 1, 1.01. 1. <coughs> Excuse me, so when you're looking at, when you're looking, the, the importance of looks at, has, have all of you seen forest plots? Do you know what these are? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is, the forest plots are where you take each study, okay, and you look at the results from each study and you combine them all into a final into a final diamond which shows you the overall when you group all these things together what is the overall effect so what this shows you is this is just significant so if it touches one one means there's no difference between either okay if it's less than one you could say well the risk ratio is 0.91 which suggests that there is a 9% benefit Okay, 9% ri less risk to having death or BPD if you're on CPAP in case room. For death, there's no difference. And 
for BPD, there's actually no difference. So the combined outcome together, it looks like there might be a slight benefit to giving CPAP. And that's actually what we do, right? When you think about what we do, our, the, the thing that we do now is we put CPAP on right away. Okay? Now, people, people may talk to you or you may hear as you spend time in the units about the cologne experience. Now, Cologne is not the perfume, Cologne. Cologne is Cologne, Germany. Because there is a um, Dr. Scribbs out in um, Germany who started publishing back in probably 2010, 2011 about her, ex her team's experience with 24 and 25 weekers, 26 weekers, that they never intubated. In almost every case, these kids were just placed on CPAP and they seem to do fine. When we, when, when other area, when other places try to replicate this, and we certainly have, I mean, we certainly put CPAP on early in case room. What do we find? Well, sure, some kids it works, some kids it doesn't. But when a delegation from the Canadian Neonatal Network flew to Germany to actually see how it is they're claiming, they're publishing that they have these amazing results, they noticed one key difference, which we haven't really done here yet. I don't know. Have you heard this yet? Mm -hmm. oh. So what they do, is, which is different than what we do, is their neonatologist and their RT and so forth are in the and nurse are in the case room or sorry are in the delivery suite. When the head is delivered, they put the CPAP on. So before the body comes out, it's a little invasive. Uh. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean as, a, as, as, a, as a mother, I know I know everybody's thinking, oh, would I want that? The whole team right in there. Uh, but that's what happens. They get that CPAP on. They get that CPAP on before the baby's taking their first breath. Because the idea being, and there's probably some uh, sense to it, that if you wait even, let's say you think you're really good, right? Well, by the time you've delivered and you've done your delayed cord clamping, right, for let's say a minute, and then you got the walk across the hall and then you're fumbling trying to get the CPAP all set up and the hoodie on and all, and all that stuff. By the time you've actually got secure CPAP, it's probably a good two minutes of age. In two minutes of age, if you're breathing 60 breaths a minute, this baby's taking 120 breaths. Okay, and the opportunity for those sticky lungs to de-recruit or not fill with air is there. So I'm not saying you should do this. I'm just saying that. We're the, we're, we're, we're the, near, near, we're the yeah. child health transport team. And don't mind us. <laughs> yeah. Pretend we're not we'll just even be here. Down here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but no, but this this may be the future. I'm just letting you know that there may come a time in the future where more work comes out where you wouldn't necessarily be called to do it, but where we might locally be asking to do this. Now, if CPAP fails, as it does sometimes, so what do you do? So there's insure or not, RSI or not, surfactant, how do you give it? So with surfactant, I'm going to skip over that only because we have, I mean, you should read if you haven't read, and I hope you will. They would, they'll get the resources, I would presume, on how to give surfactant, right? Even yes. quickly, right? Um, so, insure or not, RSI or not, very hot topics. I'll just let you know sort of what we're thinking at the moment. <laughs> so, insure is the intubate, surfactant, extubate. RSI, I know in PICU, you, you, well, I shouldn't say I know, I believe you use uh, rapid sequence for yeah. virtually everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And ICU has not ha always been the case. Um, certainly, six years ago when I arrived, uh, we did not have any standard approach for giving sedation, and that was something I really wanted to bring. Um, having said that, some of my colleagues still are sticklers and for the old days, and I know sometimes they'll say no RSI, but more and more I think we're giving it. The question though has become, what about the kids that you want to intubate just for surfactant? Um, so we're right now here trying to nail down a protocol that we're actually going to do an audit on which is to give atropine, fentanyl, surfactant, and if the baby is drowsy at all, naloxone right away. Um, if the baby's not drowsy, you just extubate, but you'd have succinylcholine on standby. Um, certainly from the intubation, intubator's point of view, uh, I've been told by more than one person that uh, intubations are smoother, more successful, and there's data to support that they're more successful if you have a RSI. Uh, but they're, they're more successful, less trauma, less oral bleeding uh, if you have the RSI. So, uh, we're, but we're going to be auditing that practice of naloxone because that's something that 
would, would be something of a new practice, but it would get around the issue of having to worry about um, what if they don't breathe because you don't want to leave them on the ventilator. Um, depending on um, depending on the future state, you might see alternative ways of giving surfactant to merge. We have had some experience here with minimally invasive surfactant treatment, which is um, into not intubating but um, cannulating the trachea with a um, central line essentially um, with a catheter and then squirting the surfactant through the catheter. So it's a very narrow catheter, you just squirt it in, you take the catheter out. Um, I won't expect anyone here to do that. Uh, that's a very specific technique, but you might see it uh, at some point. And why do we give it quickly? Um, well, the data su suggests, it's more, more so in animal models, that if you give it in a liquid interface, so when you, when you squirt the surfactant in right after uh, birth, there's a lot of fluid still in the lung. And the, s the faster you give it, the less fluid has been absorbed back into the lymphatics, and the better the surfactant distributes. So you tend to give it quickly. And, and this is a practical thing. If you're giving it through the MAC catheter, if you were to do it very, very slowly and you're including the airway, that's not good for the baby. So you want to actually squirt it in very quickly. Again, some people may have seen the side port adapter that we used to give it in. Um, certainly when I was training, we used to do it through a side port. Um, and we did it five minutes on one side, five minutes on the other side. But the evidence does seem to suggest that you're better off doing it quickly. So, Michael, this is just a, a question just for those that haven't done any of the neonates, like giving um, surfactant on transport, you know, because we're doing the, like, intubate, give surfactant, extubate right. here in the unit, but say you're in Churchill. Right. Um, the thinking might be, and maybe we can speak to this too, Sandy, and all the RTs, but you get that baby intubated, you're, you've RSI'd them, you intubate the give sur surfactant, there's some reluctance to extubate to CPAP just because now you've got a, a trip ahead of you, right? Like a one or two hour trip. Yeah. So, like, for the most part, for for the trips I've done, we've kept them intubated for the trip down and then extubated mm -hmm. Winnipeg. Yeah. I think, you know, it'll depend on the baby, it'll depend yeah. on, uh, like, let's say it's a 36 weeker. Yeah, right? yeah. If it's a 36 weeker and you give the insure, <coughs> sorry, you give the surfactant, surfactant and surfactant. within five minutes they're down to room air. Yeah. If they're down to room air and they're flailing, yeah, yeah. I would say take the tube out. Right. If it's a 27 weeker that you picked up, mm -hmm. I'd say keep the tube in. Okay. Because okay? you're right. I mean, it depends on where you are. But I, I think that, um, you know, we're training you guys to be critical thinkers and make this, like, you need to communicate with us, but at the same time, you know, speaking for myself and I think my mm -hmm. colleagues, we are going to rely on your viewpoints. Yeah. So, if, you know, I can't tell the nuances that you can. So if you say, you know, baby looks really feisty, I think this baby is going to do fine if we take the tube out. Mm -hmm. Because I know that you're capable of intubating, I might say, all right, tell you what, why don't you int extubate and put to CPAP? Spend 15 minutes seeing how he settles out, and suddenly if you call me back and you say 15 minutes later he's now on 35%, I might say put the tube back in, okay? But if you extubate and he's on room air and he's on CPAP, I think it'll be okay. You know, I mean, the transport team has come a long way in the last few years because, again, being nostalgic, when I first came back here, I remember the first time I said to send a, to bring a baby back on CPAP, I got a whole lecture about how we don't do that. You know, it's too much of a hassle, we can't do it. And I don't know exactly when we started to do it, but I remember being surprised when I, I never asked for it again until one of the nurses said, oh, do you want me to do CPAP on the way back? And I thought, oh, okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> 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 I guess we are now. Um, I think with the introduction of the RAM. The RAM. Yeah. The RAM is totally The RAM made the difference. Made the difference. Yeah. Okay. Because you so, can actually maintain it. Yeah. Right. So I think, so I think, you know, it should be an option. If we can, I mean, we know, here's a little number for you to do your math. So you have to do it. In, or maybe I can do it in my head. But... I think sometimes we underestimate how much damage we can do on the ventilator. Now I don't say that to slight the RTs, I think you do a great job, but if you think of it this way, when you say, well what, what's the big deal about keeping them intubated for two hours, right? So if you have a vent rate set at 60 breaths a minute, okay, that's 60 minutes, 60 minutes at 60 breaths a minute is 3,600 breaths. That's 7,200 breaths you've given to this child, okay? in a two hour time span that maybe they didn't need. And 
you know, if John Minsky were in the room, he'd be telling you all about, <laughs> or Todd, you could say the same thing, or any of the RTs, talk about <laughs> the first six breaths, right? The first six breaths, all it takes is six breaths in which you provide too much volume, okay? And the lungs can be damaged forever, okay? So now I'm not, now those were very large breaths in that study with the poor rabbit. Um, but um, the point being, you don't know sometimes how much, you know, you know, sometimes that when you're looking at the volume that the babies are taking, granted sometimes it's because they're taking volume as well, they're sucking hard and they wind up, you know, getting, and you're watching, you know, on the monitor I see, you know, volume of 12, then volume of 8, then a volume of 16, and so sometimes even though you're setting it a certain volume, it might be a little more. Um, so the point being we should use as little ventilation as possible, bearing in mind safety. If you've got a lung transport and you have any question whatsoever, keep the baby intubated. And so I'm, I'm glad you, you raised the question. I think when you have a question, if you're, if, if, you're, if you're questioning it, you probably should keep the baby intubated. But again, you're not in isolation. Talk to us. And, and, and you know, depending on how, like there's a lot of variables. Like what if it took you seven attempts to get that tube in? Right? I'm going to tell you, there's no way you're taking that tube out. Right? But if it was first attempt, easy intubation, surfactant went in, baby's now on room air, sure, try them off. As long as they're not 24 weeks. It's too bad they haven't managed to parasolize the blessing. That's coming. Because that would be an awesome way to get it. Yeah. Yeah, that is coming. Um, John Minsky again has talked about we should try it. Um, we're not um, we're not there yet, but we're we're looking at. Tr I think that I mean there are trials going on. Uh, if they could figure out how to aerosolize blessed, it would be amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay, meconium, okay. exciting, right? <laughs> right. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with meconium, if you don't spend a lot of time with it, uh, it's very sticky. Uh, it's, it's the uh, basically it's I call it the diary of the fetus. Um, because anything that that fetus has been exposed to in pregnancy is in the meconium and that forms the basis of drug testing on meconium okay so if a mother has ever used drugs again we talked about marijuana last time I think lasting 30 days remember that point um, in your system uh, meconium will carry it for nine months okay so um, that's that's the basis of using meconium for testing in the US um, now, why doesn't it always wait to make its debut? That's a comment there about uh, what happens during asphyxia. I think we're going to talk about that. Meconium is common. Uh, it can cause problems when it winds up in your airway. And um, what can we do about it before birth? Not much, uh, as you'll see. Um, steps during delivery and dealing with the disease. So steps during delivery, um, by September, things are going to become much, much more simplified for you guys. Um, which ca also causes a problem. Um, so that Kathy was nodding, she knows what I'm talking about. In the next NRP, which is we all have to be practicing, I think as of September 2016, mm -hmm. you no longer intubate for meconium, <coughs> prophylactically to suction out the airway. That's the latest recommendation. Sadly, that means that we lose a tremendous number of opportunities for practicing intubation. Uh, because that's certainly how I learned to intubate, was suctioning out countless numbers of tracheas from meconium um, and so that's certainly another another issue but so what is meconium um, well I even called it the diary of the trimester used for drug screening so it's got it's got a lot of stuff in it but it's basically the waste products of digestion and as we know it's quite sticky factors affecting early passage um, so motilin levels this is just a little factoid there's a little hormone called motilin in your intestinal wall, and as gestation increases, the concentration of this hormone increases. Okay, so when you're a prem, you know you'll hear if you've never heard us say this, you've heard it, you'll hear it now. Whenever I hear that there's a 25 week or the past meconium, when they say there's thick mech in the fluid, I say what? <laughs> you know, because you just you don't see it because they don't have that intestinal peristalsis. But if they do. It could be that there is a significant uh, stress on the fetus. The meconium cap is usually just the first, it's like a plug. 
sometimes you have a bit of thick, thick meconium just in the rectum, and once that passes, and I think, you know, as, as people working in the NICU, you've seen that, you wait, you wait, you wait for that first meconium, and boy, once it comes, it just comes like in, in waves. Um, so in utero, there's what's called a tonic contraction of the internal sphincter. So that's why you should not see meconium in the fluid. Unfortunately, what happens is um, if you have hypoxia, there's a reflex relaxation of that internal anal sphincter allowing the meconium to move forward to the external ring. And then the external ring certainly can lead to, uh, if it relaxes and you get the meconium passed. So any time, and this is actually a very important point that I want you all to remember, the presence of meconium in the fluid should immediately raise alarm bells for you to think about hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Okay. Sometimes what happens is you get so focused on the pulmonary, you forget the nervous system. And I will confess that actually happened to me, not, not just me, it happened to a colleague of mine once. We, I had a baby I was managing the transport of who had severe meconium, not severe, but had meconium aspiration syndrome, was on CPAP. Mm -hmm. 